My name is Jos Gerardin. I'm one of the founders of Yield.io. We are a fintech company and we have built a platform for enterprise model risk management. We are using both technology and um, artificial intelligence techniques to help our clients um, increase the efficiency of their model risk practice. And today I would like to share with you a few of the key points regarding technology that we have come across with, uh, during all our discussions with the industry. Um, the presentation, which will last approximately one hour, has three main topics. First of all, I'll start with the current state, describing the current state of model risk management. Then I would like to somehow draw some conclusions from this by indicating what are the key requirements of the, for technology that crystallize out of those challenges that we see today. And then I would like to focus on some key topics that we come across very often, which is related to the model inventory, which is also related to how to optim optimize and manage complicated business processes. And then, of course, as well, I would like to say a few words about how to incorporate machine learning and AI in model risk management practices. Um, what I'll do, uh, because of course, this type of uh, discussion can be more interesting when there are some questions. What I'll do is I will pause at the end of each of those sections to see if there is any questions. During the talk, feel free to type in your questions in the chat, which should be available, um, and I'll check there. But you can also, of course, unmute and just ask question, the question um, just by voice. Okay, so let me know first start with the current uh, section on the current state of model risk management. So before I do this, let me step back a little bit to discuss why we actually built models and, and why how this relates to model risk management. So let's assume that I'm building a statistic or a model to optimize a poker game, for instance. So in that case, I will have to model the dynamics of throwing dice. Um, and I can do this basically in two ways. I can either start from the bottom up and uh, describe the difficult uh, partial differential equations uh, that would uh, guide us, gui or that would, um, that, that would deal with the dynamics of these dice, or alternatively, I could actually as well start from a statistical point of view and say that every every dice has six sides and therefore there is a one out of six probability that a certain side ends upwards. So if I do this, then clearly that model is going to be very simple, easy to deal with, and I can use that to optimize a poker game. So in that case, why would I ever have to validate a model like this? Well, of course, if somebody has actually modified the dynamics of the dice so that there is a bit of higher probability, for instance, that the side with six dots ends upwards, then of course I should be able to detect this if I monitor the model quite accurately. So that's in the end also in finance why we validate models most often. Um, there is no, no real um, mathematical mistake or a coding error but the key risk in model risk management is that we use models in a context for which they haven't been designed because maybe the, the context or the use case has shifted a little bit. And that's the key reason why many models fail. Now, if you look at um, the amount of work related to model risk management, then that increases quite drastically every year. Um, so if we look across the industry, we see that most model inventories, which is like the collection of all the models that are being managed um, by, by a financial institution, is somewhere between 100 for a local bank and a few thousands for a large investment bank. Now, the amount of time needed for a single validation is often more than four weeks. And Normally, um, most of the models are being validated either once every few years or every time that the model has been changed or the context has changed or some of the implementation features have changed. So this leads to a tremendous amount of work. And of course, model risk, is, model risk management is much more than just validation. It also includes periodic uh, revalidation, monitoring, all kinds of governance. So there is a huge workload. And in order to be able to prioritize the different tasks necessary 
for model risk management, many financial institutions start with some tiering. So they try to identify which models carry most of the risk. Um, and this is based typically on both quantitative and qualitative features. Qualitative features uh, would be, for instance, the complexity of the model or the regulatory impact of a certain model. And that regulatory impact could, of course, be either um, a local impact because a bank has a certain branch in a local country, which could um, be important for that country, or it could be also more global uh, regulatory impact, for instance, um, for a bank who is active across Europe, say. No, typically, those type of qualitative assessments do not really vary very quickly over time. The complexity of a model is not going to change overnight, of course. On the other hand, um, part of the risk related to a model could also be driven by, for instance, the sensitivity of that model towards issues with data. Certain models, and especially like market risk models, for instance, can be very sensitive to problems in the underlying data sets or the market data that is fed into those uh, calculations. So in that case, the risk can also be high just because of that particular sensitivity. Now, typically, these type of um, issues like data quality, they can vary very quickly. It can happen at a certain moment in time, intraday, that the data feed stops working correctly and therefore leads to an issue related to data quality. So that's that part of more quantitative uh, assessments that go into model tiering are typically also the type of tasks that we try to automate. Now, the end, of, the end result of this tiering exercise will be that you will have, say, tier one, which would be the high risk models, and tier five, say, would be the, low, the lower risk models. And then you would have a model risk management practice or validation and periodic monitoring that will depend on the tier of the model itself. So high tier models, you will validate much more in depth and you will revalidate much more often while on the other hand, lower tier models, you can probably just superficially review from time to time or even try to automate that part more. So <clears throat> um, I um, normally in these type of webinars, I also try to make it a little bit more interactive by adding some polling questions. Uh, um, we checked this beforehand and it's apparently not so easy to set this up. So we won't be able to do this poll, however, um, Based on what I said before, model inventories very often have a range of models between 50 to 100 up to a few thousands. So if there's anyone in this call who has, who has a bit more at the extreme, say, so either a very low number of models or a very high mod number of models in the inventory, and if somebody would like to comment on this, then feel free to do this now, and otherwise I'll just move on to the next part of this uh, slide deck. So anyone wants to comment on the size of the model inventory that they have? Okay. So in, in that case, let me start by describing a little bit the current state of model risk management. I think there is a few key challenges that many financial institutions face today. And the first one is related to model risk quantification. So as I, as I mentioned already, Normally, you try to prioritize model risk management processes by um, defining a model tier. And an important ingredient in that tiering exercise is the quantitative features, which relates to model risk quantification. Now, the key problem that many institutions face is that model risk is not really a one-dimensional concept. It's not like market risk, where you can define expected shortfall or value at risk, and where you are able to somehow uh, summarize the entire risk in a single in a single number here and model risk you you actually need multiple kpis basically and the the main ones uh, and this was confirmed also in a very recent study by mckinsey and risk dynamics and you'll have uh, the references over here um so the, the 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 three main kpis are really model quality compliance with the regulation and somehow use for purpose or misuse of models. Um, so with, with respect to model quality, this in itself is also somehow a multidimensional topic because it relates to, first of all, data quality, like um, 
how clean is the data that feeds into the model and to what extent is the model sensitive to issues related to data quality. So that's an important question to address. Data stability, meaning um, how similar is the data that is currently flowing through the model to the data that was used to develop and also to train or calibrate the model. And then, of course, you'd like to have an understanding as well of model performance and ideally how that performance compares to other modeling approaches. So that's, that's definitely a very important KPI to, take tra to, to keep track of and to, to feed into a model tiering exercise. The second one, which is a bit, um, <clears throat> which is a bit more qualitative, of course, is the compliance with the regulation. So as, as I mentioned before, if you are a bank, for instance, operating um, in, in, in Europe, uh, or in, uh, in, in, the U in the U.S., like the headquarter in the U.S., then probably um, there will be very uh, strict strict guidelines from the regulator directly, which um, which are which are relevant to the entire global operation of the financial institution. On the other hand, it's possible that you also have a small branch in a small country like Belgium, my home country, and so. From the global point of view, um, when looking at that particular uh, amount of risk associated to Belgium, could be that the risk for the group, for the entire financial institution, is not very big because we are a very small country. Maybe there is only a very small operation there, relatively speaking. On the other hand, Belgium, being a small country, could actually also, for, for, for the local regulator, the operation of this particular bank could still be, say, the most important financial institution in the country and therefore still be very relevant. So that's why when looking at the impact of regulation on certain models that you need to take both the global and the local view to make sure that you're not missing anything material. And the last point here is, is fit for purpose or misuse of models. So as I said before, um, when you develop a model, when you create a model and put it into production, it is to be used in a certain context and also, which means in a certain business reality, but also using a certain amount of data. Um, if for whatever reason, the context changes, if you start applying the model, for instance, on a different type of derivative, or if you are uh, looking at, for instance, starting operations in a different country, and the data really changes, then that model suddenly is not anymore fit for purpose because you haven't tested if the model is working in this new context. So that's another key point to take into consideration. So one of the key challenges that uh, institutions face today is how to summarize all those KPIs and somehow a single uh, or a, a type of risk quantification, a single number, a single model risk tier. Um, on that topic, I would also like to notice that, uh, in general, model risk propagates in a non-linear fashion through the model inventory. So what do I mean by this? Let me give you one example. Let's assume we are looking at a value at risk model, so to, to, to compute market risk. So very often, let's assume, um, just basic example, that we're using value at risk and that we are using the 99% or the 1% threshold. Okay? So this means that if I would be using, say, historical VAR with a one-year history, then I would have around um, 300 or 250 scenarios, meaning that there are only three scenarios per year that are going to contribute materially to the value at risk number. Now, suppose that into the value at risk, uh, of course, what is input? Well, clearly, the, the different curves and volatility surfaces and all the market data that is being used to evaluate um, all the transactions, all the trades, all the derivatives of, of the portfolios that we are studying. And suppose that there is an interest rate curve generator that would be unstable for, say, 0.5% of all cases. So in that case, it might be that one scenario um, actually would lead to an issue in this curve generator, and therefore it could be could have a very significant impact on the value at risk. And that's what we see very often, that value at risk is driven by somehow some instabilities in market data generating um, 
gen generating algorithms. So in and, and, and that context, it's very clear that even a minor issue in one of the feeding models could lead to a huge impact on a model downstream. And that's what I, what I meant by stating that model risk propagates through the model inventory in a nonlinear fashion. Now, another theme that we see today is that more and more validation um, becomes a wider scope exercise. It's not just regulatory validation anymore. Um, and just to, il I, I wanted to give you two examples to illustrate this. First of all, when looking at artificial intelligence, for instance, we see more and more that there is also a certain amount of reputational risk associated to this. A very good, although slightly sad example is the, um, the credit card from Apple that was um, that was in the news uh, in a negative fashion a few months or yeah, a few months ago. So Apple has a credit card which is operated by Goldman Sachs. Um, of course, that credit card had credit has credit limits, um, and the limit is calculated using a machine learning algorithm. What people uh, discovered is that uh, the um, the credit limit has actually gender bias. So married couples so notice that although they shared exactly the same financial information, that the wife would have a much lower credit limit than the husband. So this is a very uh, typical example of reputational risk associated to AI. And in general, we are most of the times talking about issues with bias. Um, and related to these issues with fairness. And so when dealing with this from a model risk management point of view, the idea is that you are trying to quantify, or first of all, find measures to quantify bias and fairness, for instance, and then to have certain limits and tests associated to that before you move uh, things into production and also while the algorithms are run in production, actually. A last point, which is also relevant in this story about uh, the Apple credit card, is explainability. So during this incident, I haven't seen so far a good explanation from either Goldman Sachs or Apple to, ex to explain why the algorithm actually developed bias. Um, and this is related to somehow the black box nature of certain machine learning techniques, which means that actually explainability or trying to ex or being able to understand why a model comes to a certain conclusion is extremely important. Um, another topic related to this... Hey, uh, Fez, you, what did you... Hello? Was there a question? Okay. Um, I, I heard something, so I, I thought there was a question. But um, again, if there are questions, I will pause after this first, test, first part of the um, presentation and feel free to ask them then. Um, so what I was saying is that we related to regulatory value, well, the fact that validation has a wider scope today than a few years back, say, this is also driven in Europe, for instance, by this TRIM exercise. So the TRIM stands for Targeted Review of Internal Models. One of the feed, uh, a few topics um, that came out of that exercise was the fact that the ECB is asking many banks to step up their efforts in model monitoring, so in continuously verifying that the models work as expected, to improve um, the policies for model calibration, so basically to monitor that calibration, that calibrated parameters behave in a smooth and understandable fashion through time, and of course as well to focus on data quality um, and especially in the context of machine learning where you need larger data sets, this becomes an important exercise. Um, and the last point that I wanted to um, focus on in this first session is the fact that financial institutions more and more are looking for efficiency. And this is driven by some clear challenges in the model risk management um, uh, scope. So this is of course, centered around cost and capital consumption. Cost is uh, typically driven by the fact that there is more and more models, as I, as I mentioned before, but also because many institutions are struggling to use legacy technology to deal with novel model risk management challenges like incorporating machine learning or AI applications, for instance. And this is also linked to the fact that nowadays, um, 
quantitative profiles become more like data scientists and data scientists of course can work in many industries and not just in the financial one and of course related to capital we're talking about the the fact that regulation becomes more and more strict and so many organizations are trying to look at technology to address those objectives um, <clears throat> and this leads to like replacing legacy IT systems, uh, improving the way in which tasks are planned, um, and then hopefully as well leading to more capital reduction and turning model risk management into a value driver. But this is exactly the the, the focus of my uh, talk today. So I'll I'll not I'm not going into details here, but I'll um, wait to dive into this for the second uh, part of the of the talk. So let me pause here to see if there is any questions. Uh, so as I said, I will have a look at the chat window. Um, I will, I will, um, I will look at the chat window and see if there is any questions over here. I, I can't see any so far. Wait, let me. Um, okay, so I noticed that um, few um, few people mentioned uh, the number of um, the, the number of models in their model inventory so I, I noticed that there is indeed at least one person with a model inventory of more than 2,000 models I don't know if you want to say anything about this or okay then there was a question will we share the slides then um, I'm perfectly fine sharing the slides so I'll, I'll liaise with the WBS um, host to see how to do this practically speaking and then there was um, a question on data quality so do you consider poor data quality as model risk um, yes so as part of a model validation exercise um, indeed it's important to also look at the data of course um, so um, poor data quality if it is control well it, it is an as the data quality is an aspect of um, of model is that need to be controlled so either as a model validator for instance you would have to check that the model that the model is um, robust against uh, issues related to data quality or you need to verify that the first line has actually created some controls around the data to be able to detect data quality issues before they are fed into the the, the model itself um, <clears throat> then there was a question how do we convert model risk into a capital charge well there is of course um, this is not a, a very um, simple um, sim simple question so there is broadly speaking two ways in which um, capital uh, capital is consumed because of model risk first of all it is because um, if you look at for instance um, if you if you look at uh, if you are being reviewed by the regulator it's possible that they're going to ask for capital add-ons because of improper management of model risk so that's a very trivial way in which model risk would translate into a capital charge um, on the other hand a more say uh, like a, 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 another way of of this is when we look at for instance uh, market risk so if you have issues related to models if you have for instance an instability in a curve generator as i mentioned before um, in that case it's possible that it will lead to an increase in your um, market risk and therefore increase the capital in this particular way and but this is actually driven by the fact that one of your models is not working as it should okay so these are the two main reasons um, then there was a question are banks creating separate validation procedures for ai this is, again in itself is an, uh, like the, a topic for an entire lecture I would say however um, I, I can say a few small uh, I can say a few words about it so first of all most of the banks start from the existing model risk management framework and actually open it up to deal with some particular challenges related to machine learning or AI and so those challenges are first of all the fact that many AI applications are um, are a collection of different types of models that working that are working together in a very 
in a very um, intensive fashion. So this deep modeling this deep and dealing with these dependencies is very important. The second point is the fact that the data sets are far more big and the number of features are typically also much larger. So this leads to certain challenges related to, for instance, data quality, data stability, especially. And then um, a last point is that certain aspects of an AI application or a machine learning algorithm can be a bit more pronounced. Um, for instance, it can be more sensitive to developing bias um, and explainability, for instance, it's a bit harder very often if you're using, say, a neural network versus a logistic regression. So these are the three focus areas where banks normally change their um, model risk management frameworks to be able to deal with AI applications. Um, then there was another question, which techniques do you know to tackle poor data quality? Well, there is many, of course. Um, let me exp let me just highlight one. Uh, in the context of machine learning techniques, there exists an, a, a type of neural networks called autoencoders. Uh, an autoencoder is like a nonlinear PCA algorithm that scales very well. And so the idea there is that if the reconstruction error, so basically, if the data, so if you have a PCA, you will say. You, you, you will uh, collapse or project your any sample onto a low dimensional representation. That's how PCA works, basically. So you can do this also with autoencoders. It's a kind of projection, uh, but it's a nonlinear projection. And then if you compare basically the projection with the original sample, if this is somehow close together, then you know that there is many samples that are very similar in structure. While on the other hand, if the error is very big, then it typically indicates that you only have very few samples that are like this, and this is a way to detect multivariate outliers in an unsupervised fashion. Um, there is one more question that I'll take, um, and then I'll move on, because otherwise I will run out of time. Um, do you work with modelers, risk managers, internal or external auditors, or other levels of independent review? Well, that's um, that's a, a, another very good question. So, um, <clears throat> so of course, as you know, um, model risk is organized in, in lines of defense. First line, the modelers. Second line, the validators. Third line, the auditors. And they all have to work independently. However, if you are developing technology, which is exactly what we do as well, one of the benefits of using technology is that these different lines of defense can work better together. It's, of course, important that they do not share the same mathematical techniques, for instance, because otherwise you wouldn't have them working independently. But it is important that they can work together in a structured fashion. Um, so, and, and so, indeed, uh, we as a company, we have uh, clients who are using our technology both in first line and second line and third line or across the entire enterprise. Um, I will. I see there's more questions appearing, <clears throat> but I will um, maybe first continue um, and then get back to questions after the second part of the talk. So let me know, go back or try at least to go back um, to my slides. Okay. It's There seems to be a small problem related to the fact that WebEx, OK, yeah. Sorry for this small hiccup. Um, so now the, the next part of my talk is to see how these um, challenges, today's challenges, actually translate into requirements for technology. Um, and my, my main claim for the second part is really that as model risk managers, we should start harvesting as much data as we can because it helps a lot in improving the efficiency of a model risk management practice. Okay, and so a first, a first important set data set, which I mean, which is a very natural one, of course, is what I would call the model execution trace. So the model execution trace is basically somehow the data that flows through the model. 
So if we look at this um, simple example over here, where I have an, a small neural network that is used to separate the orange from the blue dots over here, then of course model inputs here would be the features that go into the neural network. Model output is going to be, say, the probability that a certain dot is orange. And then what we would call the realization is the actual fact if this uh, dot would be blue or orange. So, I mean, very similarly, if you have a credit risk model, for instance, our input would be client features. Um, output would be the probability that your client is, not, is going to default over a certain time horizon. And then the realization would be if this is, has actually happened, yes or no. So this clearly is like the key, the key starting point for any validation. You need to have that data. But typically, you have uh, different data sets. You might have the development data set, which was used to build the model in the first place. You might have training data sets that are used to calibrate. And you might have the data as the model is used in production um, that the model is currently generating, so these type of snapshots. Being able to access all of them is extremely uh, important, of course. Then the second point here related to data is everything related to data quality metrics. Right? So if we start monitoring both models, but also the data itself, then we start generating additional data related to, um, for instance, how well the data, uh, how, how accurate the data is. Uh, and so being able to to store those metrics as new data sets is also important because then you can start looking at evolution of data quality over time. So just one point that I wanted to, wanted to make here when you are defining metrics um, is the fact that metrics should always be normalized, have a certain scale, and be interpretable. And what I mean by that is that you want all your metrics to be of the same of the of the same scale, for instance, between a, a metric between zero and one, it need to be normalized, meaning that I should be able to compare the different um, the, the different metrics, and it needs to be interpretable. For instance, one meaning that the, this particular feature of data quality would be very good, and zero meaning it's extremely bad. So, like just to give you a very trivial example, suppose that I have um, like the the data in my data set itself that is stored would be WI, while the data, the true data, if it would be possible to, 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 to detect this, would be WR, then I could define some kind of a very simple uh, distance measure, um, which is either zero if the uh, data coincides, and one when the data does not coincide. In that case, if I compute this across my entire data set, I would have a certain quality score that would be one when all the data is correctly represented and zero when it's not. Of course, the challenge is to detect that the data is actually correctly represented. This often requires um, manual verification. And so in that case, it's important to sample the data set accurately and in a smart fashion to be able to do this in an efficient way. Um, and other data that is related to analytics that is worth storing is, of course, anything related to model performance. So you typically do uh, um, backtesting from time to time. You might also monitor model performance as it happens uh, over time, as it evolves over time and real time. And then, of course, related to that, also model risk, model, quanti model risk quantification generate some KPIs that we have discussed and being able to store those as time series per model is an extremely important and valuable source of information. Now, if you are able to actually make all of this data available, then of course you will increase the transparency. Um, you will increase the transparency because everyone would be able to create say, somehow dashboards to show model risk uh, across the model portfolio. But it would also drive cultural change because if it is clear, if, if, if any party who has obviously allowed to look at the data would be able to query this type of data, it will be very easy um, for people to see how mo models are evolving um, and somehow model risk will be properly understood by the entire organization because this ability of creating dashboards, of communicating clearly about those type of aspects will, um, will increase. And this ultimately should, of course, lead to better models. 
So the other type of data that we should start storing in the context of model risk management as related to processes. So the first and most important process, of course, in the context of model risk management is the model lifecycle itself. Um, I'm assuming that most people here uh, are, are well aware of the different steps in a model lifecycle. Uh, I showed you a few, um, like one example over here. But if you would be able to store all that information in a systematic fashion, then you would understand that it would be easier for an organization to estimate how much time you need for a certain validation. You would know how often there are different iterations between, between different uh, steps in the, model, in the model life cycle and so on. So this is, again, from a logistical point of view, a very interesting uh, data set. And um, another one is everything related to the data. So if you start gathering all that data, centralizing all the data relevant for model risk management, then you should also start monitoring how that data evolves over time, of course, to be able to understand uh, to what extent the data is being used. And this in itself is, again, an interesting source of information. So making this more process-related data available will then lead to being able to plan better, basically, because you will understand much more accurately how all the model risk management processes actually happen in your organization. And therefore, it will be easier to plan activities like uh, periodic validation or um, monitoring exercises of the models. And so this leads me to my first, say, technology requirement. If you um, build a model risk management solution, a platform, then one of the key requirements for technology should be that you should be able to collect, store, and expose all model risk management related data. And so as I said before, this is not only just uh, data relevant to the model itself. It can also be some metadata meta related to, for instance, the time spent across the model life cycle. And being able to have all that data available will make your model risk management much more efficient. A second point that I wanted to make here is really related to modularity. So if you look at um, many more legacy or older systems, you will see that, um, well, first of all, model risk management systems are extremely workflow driven, um, but are also a bit monolithic, meaning that the different tasks or the different features of the software all reside in a single large package that is harder to um, customize. And this, of course, is a challenge for many reasons. So first of all, because model risk management by nature is an enterprise activity that requires a collaboration between multiple teams. So you should be able to support um, teams that work in different geographies, but that potentially also work with different tools. So being able to integrate or to talk with each of those tools is an extremely valuable point um, because it's not always easy to enforce that the entire organization works with a single tool, um, especially because the, it, it, it's very hard to come up with universal solutions, basically. Secondly, um, the analytics and the analytics or so the models might be available in many different systems. So it often happens that a certain model, for instance, to price a derivative, is available in many different systems, in many different trading systems, for instance. And it's very hard in that case to, to, to enforce that everyone would centralize all the analytics in a single place. So being able to integrate with each of those systems and at least to retrieve all the relevant data is again an important uh, aspect. And then my last point here is that model risk management definitely evolves over time because of new regulatory requirements, but also because of new model types, for instance. And, and this means that you need to have a flexible, a flexible system to be able to deal with that. And all of this leads me to my second technology requir requirement, which is that when you are building a model risk management platform, you should also make sure that the platform itself is, mod is modular by nature and is able to integrate with alternative uh, tools. And just to diagra diagrammatically show you how this would look like more concretely, well, 
this is obviously just one ID. Um, I'm sure you can come up with many more and better better ideas, but one possible solution would be to have, say, a quantitative model risk engine that helps with, um, for instance, the development of prototypes, um, generating all the quantitative tasks related to validation and monitoring, being able to use this data that you have created to create a validation report and keep the lineage or the linkage between the data that was used, the analytics that were validated and the report that was generated. And to be able to do this, to do this at scale, you would also need some infrastructure. So let's assume we have this type of quantitative tool that is able to run all those analysis, then we are going to basically generate a lot of data, as I just mentioned. And let's assume that that data would be available to a set of microservices um, to the outside world. In that case, you would be able to use the data, for instance, to create dashboards, uh, but also to interact with uh, workflow management engines. And I'll give you an example of such an engine in the final part of my, of my talk. Um, and so if you build it in this particular uh, way, you have, say, a strong data-driven core engine that exposes all the data and where you can integrate other tools, other components, other modules with. And by doing this, you have a very flexible way of dealing with the ever-changing nature of model risk management tasks. So this is like how these technology requirements could translate into an actual architecture. So yeah, I had another poll here, which was more related to what are your plans in 2020. This was uh, written before the COVID-19 pandemic, so probably your priorities might have changed a little bit since then. Um, but still, if anyone wants to say anything about your to this year's priorities, when it comes to model risk management technology, feel free to speak up or um, put your question in the chat. So this is the um, the this is um, the second part of my of my talk. So let me go back again to um, to the chat to see if there were any further questions. Um, so wait, there is quite a few again. Um, so the first one that I didn't address before was, are regulators accepting or are they ready to accept machine learning models for calculating banks' capital requirements? So, and, and someone already answered that the regulators are fairly reluctant. So indeed, there is a certain reluctancy, a reluctance um, from the regulators. On the other hand, they should not prohibit financial institutions to start working with some machine learning models. So what we see, what we see very often is that the, the models that are not that heavily regulated, such as a credit decision model, for instance, that these are good candidates to start um, working with machine learning tools. And then, of course, the closer you get to actual regulation, the harder it gets some regulators, for instance, the Dutch regulator is fairly open, um, well, at least some people at the Dutch regulator are fairly open to start using machine learning techniques, but others might be a little bit more, um, indeed, waiting, waiting to see what crystallizes. Now, another point to make here is that you can, of course, use machine learning models as well in the context of a regulatory validation. So suppose you have a classical model that you want to validate. You could use a machine learning technique as an alternative to detect outliers, or you can build a benchmark model using machine learning. In that case, again, it's a bit easier to have that discussion with your regulator because this is an indi an indi more indirect use of um, machine learning. Um, <clears throat> So then there is a, another uh, rather uh, specific question. And credit risk, how do you validate negatives to people you did not land to because you did not land them and hence are not monitoring them? So yeah, well, that's a, a very universal question. If you are building a credit decision model, how do you know from, how can you learn from the data uh, uh, for all the people who never applied <laughs> for or, or who ref you refused an, uh, a, a loan? So in that case, um, well, one, one possible uh, way is to have a certain testing budget. Um, basically, you set aside a certain amount of capital that you will use 
to address a new type of client, basically to harvest new data. And there exist certain techniques, especially from operations research, that can help you in setting up that experiment as optimally as possible. What I mean by that is that you will be able to select those people to apply for a, for, for a loan that would give you the most information uh, given the limited testing budget that you have. Um, let me see. There, and then there was one more question, how to aggregate model risk across the inventory. So yes, that's indeed always a very hard problem. Um, so th there is certain types of KPIs that you can somehow aggregate a little bit. Um, so everything related to, for instance, um, well, everything related so, so the, the one way of aggregation is that you will, you start assigning, say, a certain uh, score, a certain metric uh, with the health of every model. But then, if you start aggregating, you would basically have to um, aggregate together each of those scores. So you can use a weighted scheme where, for instance, you are using the tiering as a weight factor to aggregate this together. However, um, this is just a very a uh, rule-based way of doing this, and there might be others um, that could be that could be used, of course. So these were the questions. So let me then um, end this presentation and the last part, where I would like to show you a few concrete use cases of the use of these technology requirements in the context of model model risk. Um, so my first the the first example is about a model inventory. So as many of you I'm sure almost everyone here uh, knows if you have a model inventory, that uh, inventory will have um, certain elements like the model type, the owner, what's the status, as is a model in production, under development, under validation, under review, um, all of these fields. And what is important, of course, is that each of those fields kind of relate to each other, right? So a model owner, as typically, you, you might have local model owners. so per region, you will have an owner. You can have models that depend on other models, like in the context of value at risk. And so all of those dependencies need to be kept track of. And this is typically relatively hard to do in a traditional model inventory that looks more like a relational database. And so in a typical relational database, you would have multiple tables. Um, and then to be able to link topics together, you would have to build what is called lookup tables, basically. So just to give you a very basic example, let's assume I have a, a table with the models that are used um, in, the, in, in, in the financial institution. So I would have a whole white model, a Black Scholes, and a Heston option pricing model. And then those models might be used in, in different countries. And they also, they also might be used in different business lines. So then if I would want to indicate in this simple uh, database representation of a model inventory, if I would like to indicate that the whole white model is used in the UK, for instance, then I would have to, have to be able to pair somehow the ID of the whole white model with the ID of the UK region. So this is what is done in these lookup tables over here. So as you can see, Representing information in this particular way, uh, and of course, this is a naive way of representing it, but still, this is to illustrate the, the typical issues that arise. To be able to, to do it in this way leads to some, um, so some drawbacks, like the fact that this is not very naturally represented, and the fact that it's very hard to add new, new fields, because if certain, certainly I'd like to add another field related to, say, data sources, then I would create another table here, and I would have to create new lookup tables as well. So to be able to deal with this, more and more we see that model inventories start being used uh, or being represented as graphs. Okay, so in a graph database, you can you what, the way, what you are um, creating as a database that stores both the objects together with the relationships between them. And you can query the relationships in exactly the same way as you would query the objects themselves. And this leads to much more natural representation. And it actually leads also to a much more transparent way of looking at model risk. Okay, So 
Um, there exist open source uh, tools like uh, Neo4j as a very, very well known graph database that you can use uh, for free it's, um, and, and that you can actually use uh, easily to create a, mo a graph based model inventory. So this um, is again a nice illustration I think of these uh, two technology requirements. First of all, it's very much data driven because now we have actually created or the, the relationships between objects become data as well. So this is really nice and increases the transparency. And secondly, it's very modular. Um, you can just use a graph database like this and then interact with other systems in a simple fashion because Neo4j is quite open to integrate with. Another quick example that I wanted to show is related to um, business processes. So as I said before, in model risk management, you have many complicated processes that, uh, that, that require a lot of communication between different teams and entities. And I just wanted to show you, an, uh, say, an, uh, an open source syntax for representing business processes. It's called BPMN and stands for Business Process Model Annotation. So this is a graphical language that you can use to create a business process and then you actually have BPMN engines that can execute those processes. And just to give you one example, suppose that I wanted to represent, say, the requ request for an independent review, then I could represent it in this way where I have the first line, someone who is um, basically ask, initiating the process of requesting an independent review for his mo or her model, and he would upload the data and the documentation um, once this would be complete, and this can be checked by the engine itself, basically, it would be a, a task would appear in the manager's inbox, say, um, to assign a validator to that particular task, and then you could automatically, for instance, trigger a set of backtesting tasks or performance checks, and then you could uh, create automatically a task for the model validator to review this, re this report. So as you can see, it's a very natural way of representing a process. This process can then be executed and automated. And again, this, is very, this very much matches these technology requirements because first of all, it's very data driven. This workflow engine here is going to be able to um, store all the data related to the execution of this process. So this will help you optimizing validation tasks later on. And it's again modular because you have many different BPMN engines, I'm sure in your institution, you might have a few BPMN engines already. And so you can basically interact with those very easily. Um, and then I had a last point very quickly again um, about AI and machine learning. So the, well, the only thing I wanted to maybe mention today is that in the context of, say, adopting your um, model risk management framework to deal with AI, there is quite a few nice papers about um, requirements for safe AI applications. And this could serve as a source of inspiration uh, for many of the model risk management frameworks that you might have to create. So I'm, I'm referring here to already a fairly old paper from people from Stanford and Berkeley University, and it's about um, about five principles to create um, a safe AI application. I'll just highlight two, um, but you ca I can refer to the slides and to this paper if you want to know more. But um, for instance, one example here is that if you start um, if you start implementing a machine learning application, you should make sure that you define very clearly the optimization target because otherwise it can lead to unintended consequences. And the example of the paper was quite funny. They were describing the training of a cleaning robot. So if I, for instance, build a cleaning robot and I say, okay, to this robot must clean the room as quickly as possible. In that case, maybe the robot is going to throw things out of the window. It will lead to a clean room, but it has some unintended consequences. So being able to specify very accurately what the optimization target is important because machine learning algorithms are very good optimizers, basically. Um, I'll, I'll leave you, I, I, I leave most of the um, these, um, principles aside, but I wanted to end with one, which is one of my favorites, and it's 
being able to guard against distributional shifts. Of course, any model that you validate has to be able to deal with changes in the underlying data distribution. But with, in the context of machine learning, what is a bit special is that machine learning algorithms have very nonlinear decision boundaries, which can lead to strange behavior. Okay, so the example that I show here is a classifier that classifies pictures uh, into a picture of a panda or a picture of a gibbon. So what was, you, what was done here was to create a, a, a little bit of very non-random noise to modify this picture of the panda. Um, and actually, this confuses completely the machine learning classifier because here it thinks that actually this is a, a given with 99% certainty. For a human, this is very, uh, the, these two pictures are very similar. For the machine learning algorithm, it's completely different. And this is because of these uh, high dimensional nonlinear decision boundaries. So the best way to um, guard against that particular issue is to be able to run in parallel so more simple models that, of course, are less accurate, but that, because of their simplicity, would not be sensitive to this type of adversarial hacking. Okay, so that's one, one important point maybe to note. Um, and this brings me to the conclusion of today's talk, which is that um, model risk management is going through an industrialization phase. I hope I have explained this uh, by by showing you what are the key challenges today, what's the current state of m m model risk management. And I have a very strong belief that technology can help addressing those challenges. I have given you some two very important technology requirements. I showed you one example, uh, sorry, one example architecture to implement this. And then uh, finally, I've shown you as well some examples uh, that are linked to those particular technology requirements to, just to showcase what can be done even with tools that are freely available on the web. So this concludes my talk. Let me um, see if there is any further questions. So I don't see any more questions in the chat. I don't know if there's anyone who wants to ask a question. Um, and if not, I would like to thank all of you for your attention. Uh, stay healthy, I would say. And thanks for your interest in this talk.